So I love that poem. I love the idea of fighting a fight. Fighting a fight. Yes, I fight, but I've learned that it doesn't really work, for me anyway, to fight with fists or with angry words. That I fight the best when I fight with hope and with love. And I believe that that's so much what the 3% Conference is all about. Now don't get me wrong, I also believe that I am as tough as shoe leather. But I didn't get that way from being hard. There were times in my life where I have been hard and I have been angry and I have been mean as a snake. But that didn't work because for me, no one wanted to listen to me, no one wanted to respond to me, no one wanted to help me or heed me. The best way that I've always found is to fight with love and with strength and with courage. To fight with the divine that is deep in my spirit, showing me the way, the way of grace and hope and forgiveness. Because hard is a poison that I drink waiting for someone else to die. And love is a light that I can shine on everyone. So just so you know, for today, I'm gonna speak to you from my highest self, not my normal self. Um, I believe that uh, when I get up here, you know, something else takes over. You know, I'm back there and I'm so worried about lipstick and hair and my, my heart is like, ba-boom, 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 terrified, I'm terrified. And then I come out here and I'm, I'm fine. And from here to there, the only thing I asked was that Lily and Sarah and Grace, my three daughters, would come with me and be standing up here with me. And so for me, they are my higher self. Okay, so I just did 23andMe. And I'm sure you guys know what that is. It's genetic testing. And I did 23andMe because the legend in my family is that we are American Indian. And I wanted to know more about this American Indian thing that was going on. You know, we were Micmacs from Canada and we were Cherokee from the South. And, you know, I, I really said that, you know, that's why I am the way I am and that's how I got tough and blah, blah, blah. So I do the 23 May, da, 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 it comes back six weeks, zero American Indian. <laughs> nothing, nothing, like the whitest person ever. Okay, I, it was shocking to me. However, I am proud to say that I am tested as one of the highest for Neanderthal. <laughs> I am a Neanderthal. And I am such a Neanderthal that my great-grandmother to the 250th power was 100% Neanderthal. And I really like that. So I, when I think about my 250th to the power Neanderthal grandma, um, I like to think about all the twists and turns and everything else that sort of got me here, um, that got you here. You know, those, all the times that someone met someone else and that genetic power went down to somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. You know, I think about my Neanderthal 250 power grandma you know, uh, having a baby, or killing a deer, or watching the snowfall. Um, and I think about what a miracle that is, and what a miracle I am, and what a miracle we all are, that we are actually here. That all of those people for hundreds of thousands of years met, had babies, and met again. And so while we are here, while we are, we are all miracles, I do believe that we can choose to make the most of our lives here. I was born in Newfoundland, Canada, on a really small Air Force base, whose sole purpose was to refuel the B-2 bombers that went around in the sky during the height of the Cold War. Um, to sort of monitor nuclear activity. They flew 24 hours, seven days a week. 
My father was stationed at this very small Air Force base from Kentucky, where he grew up. And my mother grew up in a Newfoundland fishing village, um, not far from this Air Force base. And she had eight brothers and sisters, and they were incredibly poor. And so they all pooled their money together, and they took a vote. And my, grand, my mother, excuse me, my mother was deemed the smartest of everyone in the family. And because she probably had the most Neanderthal blood, FYI. <laughs> and um, so she went to Montreal to secretarial school. And when she came back, she became the commanding officer on that Air Force base. And that's where she met my father. And they were married in June of, uh, excuse me, they were in married the day after Christmas in 1963, and I was born in June the following year. A few years later, we moved to my father's hometown, which is Louisville, Kentucky, also the home of Muhammad Ali. And um, we were poor. My father um, went to school on the GI Bill. My uh, dad worked about three different jobs and my mom babysat kids in our house. Um, we ate a lot of pancakes for dinner, um, but we were happy, sad, angry, confused, happy, sad, you know, like all families. Um, but my parents believed deeply in the power of education, right? Because that was the thing that had gotten my mother out of Newfoundland. And so they really pushed me to study hard, to work hard, and I did. Um, I went to a very prestigious college uh, because of that hard work. After school, I went to New York City and I became the senior art director at Calvin Klein. There, I did the Marky Mark and Kate Moss campaigns. And this was at a time when Calvin's company was really um, not doing well. Um, I was 27 years old and uh, we didn't really have focus groups back then, and um, everything was from our gut, and the campaigns worked, and Calvin got his turnaround, and I started to believe in my abilities. So in 1994, um, at the very wise age of 30, I started my own agency, and I thought, oh man, this is it, you know? I, um, I got married, um, you know, just as a way to Keep my, you know, I fell in love and kept my stability going. Um, I worked my tail off. I put my life savings into that company. And I just got clients and kept moving in the direction of my dreams. The ups and downs, the winning pitches, losing pitches, changing light bulbs, dealing with everything, I loved everything about it. And I thought, you know what? This is what life is about. Life is about advertising. But in 2002, my life changed in a very profound way. And I had my first baby, Lily. And then in 2004, I had my twins, Sarah and Grace. And I became a mom. And this was the most wonderful job I had ever had. I loved being a mom. And I loved it more than anything else in the world. At one point, I even considered giving up my agency in order to be a full-time mom. Uh, but I decided that it was better for me to be a role model and a mom at the same time. And so that's what I chose to do. In 2008, my husband and I got a divorce. Um, we were great co-parents. We were not great at being husband and wife, but we were great co-parents. And so I bought my own house. Um, it was at the end of a road a dead-end road on Long Island Sound in Stamford, Connecticut. It was a beautiful Victorian. Um, extensive renovations had to be done to it, and that took about a year and a half. And so um, by Christmas of 2011, um, we had moved into the house, uh, me and my three girls. So it was Christmas Eve, and um, my children went to bed on the top floor, the third floor. Uh, my mom and dad went to bed on the second floor. And I stayed up 
very, very late wrapping um, presents. I finally went to bed and I woke up um, choking for air, gasping for air. Um, on the outside of the house, there was scaffolding everywhere um, because we were waiting to start the changeover of the new siding in the spring. So I knew that, um, and so I went out immediately out of the window, um, and I ran and looked down the side of my house, and I saw sparks flying out of the back of the house. I saw sparks flying all the way down Chopin Avenue, and I saw my parents' window. Um, so it, I, at that point, I made the decision um, to bypass their window um, to go to my children. Um, and I went up the scaffolding on the outside of the house. I opened the window on the third floor and the smoke nearly uh, took me off the scaffolding. It was so thick, um, it was so hot, and I couldn't get in. Um, I tried and I tried and I tried, but I couldn't get in. Um, all of this felt like an eternity. It was zero degree weather, um, and I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. Finally, my neighbor comes out, and in my mind, I'm thinking that they must be behind the house. They must be behind the house with my mom and dad. And I'm screaming, where are they? Where are they? Um, where are the police? Where are the firemen? Where are my children? Where are my parents? And um, I uh, finally I'm dragged off the scaffolding by the firemen and brought down. And um, my three children died that night in that fire. And my parents died um, in that fire trying to save them. Uh, they had gone up the interior stairs. And, um, and I lived. And I didn't want to live. Um, I was blown to bits. I was completely blown to bits. And I was nothing. I felt like nothing. I wanted to be nothing. I wanted to die. I kept asking God, why won't he take me? Why won't she take me? Um, I don't really believe God has a gender. Um, but, you know, I was still here and um, that wasn't really working, um, the anguish part. So I moved to Arkansas. My friend, Kate, um, who I had met at that very prestigious college um, at Vanderbilt at a sorority party 30-something um, years prior, said, why don't you come and live with me and my husband, Jess? And I think that's a miracle um, that they did that because I had no place to go. I went to about four different mental facilities. Um, people kept thinking that I was crazy you know, she must be crazy, right? I mean, they all thought for sure I was going to kill myself. I thought I was going to kill myself. Why wouldn't they think I was going to kill myself? Um, but I hadn't been struck mentally ill, right? I hadn't been struck crazy. I was struck sad. So I lived with Kate. Um, you know, I, I never smiled. Um, I vividly remember the first time that I did smile. And it was... Uh, it was like my, my face hurt. And I remember feeling incredibly guilty, um, like I shouldn't be sad. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't be happy, I should only be sad. Um, and every time I thought about dying or, or you know, killing myself, I kept worrying like, well, what if I don't find them? Or what if uh, you know, people that do that have to go someplace else? Or what if um, I have to live this life over again? I mean, no way am I living this life over again. <laughs> I'm hoping my Neanderthal status actually genetically makes me ready to not ever have to come back to this earth plane again. <laughs> that's that's my, my hope on that one. Oh. The other person that saved me is my now husband, Bill. Um, Bill Duke. Um, 
married me in July 2014. And I had met him in his grandfather's kitchen when I was 20 something years old because I had been dating his younger half brother from college. <laughs> and, um, but that was a long time ago. And so 30 some odd years later, when I was lying in the first hospital in Stanford, um, it was Bill and his family that were at the end of my bed um, to make sure that I was okay because they didn't live too far away. And I think that's a miracle. I think that's a miracle that uh, Bill is in my life. I'm also here because when I was 25 years old, I met Jim Winters. Jim Winters is my business partner and has been since 2006. And Jim and I used to work at Esquire magazine together. Um, and in 06, we came together as a partnership. And Jim made it his business to keep our company alive so that when I came back, I would have something to come home to. And I think that's a miracle too. My three daughters live on inside of me. They are the crucial reason that I am still here because I can still feel their love. Our connection is different, but it is just as strong. And on some days, it feels stronger than even when they were here. And I know that doesn't sound possible. So anyway, today I see the world through much different eyes. After a little more than a year living with my friend Kate in Arkansas, I decided it was time to come back to work. I felt like I could do it. Um, I felt like I was willing to try. And little by little, I started to feel better. Work helped me find dignity, a part of me who I once was. So now I have a new reason to be here because I believe that if I'm going to be here, if my Neanderthal great to the 250th power grandma did her part, I could certainly do my part. And I believe that all of us are here to be of service. For me, I want to do something that makes a difference in this world that honors my three girls. In 2007, Jim Winters and I did a Women's Wear Daily CEO Summit. And at that summit, we talked about the importance of empathy in advertising, the importance of empathy in marketing. And our point of view was that true innovation could only come when we really listen to our consumers, that we have to really try to understand the world through their eyes, through their ears, that this was really only the, the only way to get to meaningful creative. This was, at that time, a very revolutionary idea, and it has since become our point of difference and certainly the guiding light of our firm. It is what we believe today, now, more than ever. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about work. Fast forward to 2015, and we are working on a pitch for a $10 billion global beauty company. And they're like, OK we need you to do an empowering ad. So <laughs> we're like, great. We really want to do one. So we started with Listening Lab, and it was a part of our empathy-based creative process. And we got an insight that we hadn't expected, because for us, real women lead us to the better creative concept. The question was simple. Would you wear red lipstick to ask for a raise. Now, before we did our listening lab, we thought, oh man, this is so great. You know, we're going to get people to wear red lipstick and they're going to ask for a raise and we're going to close the, the gap, the wage gap, and it's going to be like the new ALS and everybody's going to spread it. And you know, like when you fall in love with your first big idea, you're like, yeah, that's it. We got it. We nailed it. Woo. And, um, but you know, we were dead wrong. Okay. <laughs> Because what actually happened is that we went and we asked these young women and they said, oh yeah, I love red lipstick. 
It makes me feel empowered. It makes me feel like I want to take on anything. It makes me feel like I can do anything. I love it. Oh, oh, I love red lipstick. I love it. I wear it all the time. Oh, good. Okay, so check. Um, would you wear red lipstick to ask for a raise? Oh, no, they said. I would never, no, I'm not kidding. I would never wear red lipstick to ask for a raise. I don't want to push my, you know, femininity into someone else's face. I don't want to do that. No, no, no. I would never wear red lipstick to ask for a raise. So this was a conundrum. Why is it that these young women felt great when they wore red lipstick or in whatever it is that they did, but yet they felt uncomfortable going into the workplace and asking for a raise with that empowering feminine symbol on. After a lot of research, we found obviously the confidence gap and some of the very real drivers of why women and men behave so differently in the workplace. And what was at the center of it all? The objectification of women and the very serious impact this has on a woman's confidence. And when we Googled objectification of women, because that's the kind of researchers we are. <laughs> what came up? Advertising. The very industry that I love and that we all work in. So this was when Jim and I knew that we had the power to make a difference. Jim and I decided that we were going to stop objectifying women and men in all of the advertising that we do from here and into the future. And we're, we were going to ask brands and agencies to consider doing the same. Just as a side note, I want you to know that I have made Kate Moss skinnier. I have given Marky Mark a really nice six pack. I have certainly thinned out more supermodels, made their skin more perfect, made sexual objectifying ads as a way of clickbait as a way to get people to stop and notice. Um, I have done, personally, all of those things. My background is in creative. I was retouching images back when you used a paintbrush, okay? So, <laughs> some of you may remember those days. Um, but it has uh, been perfection and that idea of, of making a woman into something that is completely unattainable by any human means. Um, just focusing on a woman's body part, like her breasts or her rear end or her legs or what her you know perfect eyeball. Um, and, um, and also uh, showing women as props. Props where they are the object and not the subject of what is happening in the ad. I have done all those things. And I'm not proud of it, but I didn't know any better. And now that I do know better, um, I, not only have I stopped it, but I think that we all need to stop it. The key reason behind all of this is that as women, we will not be treated as equal until we are portrayed as equal. And so when you see an ad, beach body ready, some of the things I'm going to show you in two seconds. Please think about what it means. Would you give that woman a raise or a promotion? Uh, would you, you know, um, hire her? So these are the kinds of questions that I think are important, and I do think that this is the reason why objectification is such a curse for women, especially if. In these ads, it was a, an African-American man. If in these ads, it was a Native American. Um, you know, people got upset when the Neanderthals took up over Geico, for Christ's sake, you know? So I think that, um, you know, thinking about equality as it relates to portrayal is an important part of not only the world, but precisely is what in is in every single one of our wheelhouses. 
To bring this to life, objectification, we launched a video in January that gave voice to the voiceless women in the ads that had come up in our Google search. So what would an object say? Um, and then on International Women's Day, we launched a second video that showed the harm caused by objectification. This is a culmination of both of these films. What is a thigh gap? When you're standing straight up, there's like a gap in between your thighs. Girls just don't want their thighs to touch. No. The Kylie Jenner challenge has gone viral. Doctors warn it can cause a number of issues. Oh my God. Oh my God. We raise our little girls to view their bodies as projects to constantly be improved. Advertising often trivializes battering, sexual assault, and even murder. Cologne continues to speak of up to a thousand men groping women on New Year's Eve. I just think that it's harming women psychologically, physically, mentally, socially. You released a video anonymously on YouTube. Yes. I wish I could play the whole video here because it's incredibly powerful. I love giving blowjobs to sandwiches. I hope when my daughter grows up that she has friends just like these. The key to my heart? A man that smells like a vagina. I'd sell my body for a burger. The viral video her agency created has exploded on social media. Badger is calling on industry colleagues to stop using images that objectify women and girls. In a world where we hear over and over again sex sells, can you make a difference? Can you get the rest of the industry to go along with this? I stand up for my sister and my mom. Girls are growing up thinking that how they look is more important than how they feel or who they are and what they can do. news is, is that people care very deeply about this issue, and we have been deeply honored by their response. I saw on Twitter the other day where the grandson of Carl's Jr., do you know which one Carl's Jr. is? Um, the grandson of Carl's Jr. Um, said that he would like for the CEO of Carl's Jr. Uh, to be removed, and he stated that one of the most important reasons, besides the fact that he was supporting Trump, um, <laughs> was that, yeah, of course he is, um, <laughs> was, that, was that he um, felt that the objectification of women in their advertising was wrong. And he actually used those words, objectification of women. So there are changes that are happening. Um, and uh, obviously, there are a lot of people that are a part of it. So now I have found my reason to be here which, given all that has happened, is a great source of hope for me. The legacy I want to leave in the name of my girls, Lily and Sarah and Grace, is to stop the objectification of women in advertising. I decided to choose this very narrow but important idea because it's A, something I can do, right? So I think it's important, you know, I, I, I can't, you know, I'm not a, neuroscientist or whatever, so I can't cure brain, brain, uh, brain cancer, even though I wish I could. But working to stop the objectification of women in advertising is something firmly in my house that I can do. Now, ending the objectification of women in our work is not only the right thing to do, it is the smart thing to do for our businesses. Women are rejecting the advertising they see. 91% say, 91% of women say they don't even identify with that advertising. This is very scary because women control a 20, US, 20 trillion US dollar world economy, which is bigger than the economies of China and India combined. So imagine if the advertising that we're creating has no bullseye. 
If we spoke to women and portrayed them with respect and empathy, depicting their full humanity, making a real connection, treating women as equals, all of us can do this. And all of us have seen the success of what happens when we treat girls and women as whole, human, and strong. We knew from academic research the harm objectification has on girls and women. Obviously, there are many studies that we can all point to. But what about the harm to the brands we work for? This, we felt, was the smartest, quickest, best way to get to the clients that we all work for. We wanted data. We wanted data to know the negative effect objectification has on consumers. So we partnered with a very prestigious research company. And for our study, we chose brands in different categories, from jeans to gum, 10 different brands in total. Each brand was shown in an objectifying ad and in a non-objectifying one. I am going to show you a couple of those ads right now. So for the Calvin ad, I'm going to use this one. For the Calvin ad, um, the, on the left is obviously the objectifying one, although people do ask me. And on the right um, is the non-objectifying one. I mean, the, the ad on the left, she's obviously a prop of some sort. Um, you know, she's, uh, is she passed out? Is she dead? Is she in the reps? Uh, you know, is she enjoying it? He is the subject, right? He is in control. He is changing things. The woman on the right is, she is in control. She is the subject. Now, what's important here is not just the definition, but the scores. So this was put into a, um, over 3,000 ads are in this particular company's database. And across every KPI, uh, every single one of the non-objectifying ads scored higher with Hispanics, with, uh, in the general population, with Hispanics, with African Americans, with women, uh, with millennials, et cetera. This particular ad, so if zero is baseline, the Calvin Klein objectifying ad in brand reputation scored negative 100. In the Stuart Weitzman sample, the one on the left, you know, here you have, I mean, I do this every Friday night with my three girlfriends. <laughs> Uh, in my shoes. Uh, I wear better shoes than Stuart Weitzman, but um, anyway, I'm just kidding. Um, but the, you know, the three women here, they're interchangeable. They have the same length of leg. That doesn't happen in real life. Um, their skin is absolutely flawless. They're just basic slight tones of gray off from one another. And they're naked. And they have a big logo right across their rear ends. So these are interchangeable props. Meanwhile, each one of these women have a um, social media following of at least 15 to 20 million. Okay, could you imagine treating, a, I mean, why treat anybody this way? Um, they are um, three of the most powerful supermodels in the world. And this stood um, on Fifth Avenue at about 50 feet tall. So for everybody to see. We did a third film, which you can see at womennotobjects.com, where we had children come in to look at outdoor ads like this one. And it's pretty phenomenal what happens to little boys and little girls um, when they see this sort of advertising. The little boys were the most astonishing because they just shut right down. You know, they came in, they're like, I'm a boy, I'm a boy, I'm a boy. What's that camera over there? Let's have some fun. Da, da, da. And then they sit down and we show them the ad and they're like, whoa, like zero, nothing. Their entire face is shut down. I don't feel comfortable. They want to leave. So we're hurting everybody with this. 
And that score was uh, in the negative 120 in brand reputation. And then this is for gum. So uh, this ad, um, I don't have to say too many things about it. Um, gum does not come from that part of a woman. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, this scored in negative plus 200. So um, again, in brand reputation and intent to purchase, they all scored in the negative 100s. So all of this information and more um, is free on our website, womennotobjects.com. Um, Jim and I did this research to make it public to everyone. So the next time somebody's boss's boss's boss says, why can't we make her boobs bigger? You can go print this out and have a talk about it. Um, objectification is disastrous not only to brand reputation, but extremely damaging, as I've said, to purchase intent. To the point that people don't even want to interact with your brand, and people don't want to buy whatever it is that you're trying to sell. Celebrating women as whole, human, and strong, including all of our body types and faces and races and ethnicities, is critical as we look to the future and want every girl to know that who she is is not how she looks. And for every man and boy to know that every girl is his equal, emotionally, sexually, intellectually, and spiritually. You know, a lot of people say that what it is that we're trying to do is get rid of sex. Okay, sex with a toy, maybe. Sex with an object, maybe. Sex is great when it's equal. Nobody has a problem with equal sex. What we're talking about is when women are reduced to objects. So many people have said to me, what you are trying to do is impossible. Here is what Muhammad Ali, my fellow Kentuckian said about impossible. Impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration, it is a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. So now I want to talk about the three things I've learned along the way that have helped me create change in my own life. And I share them t with you in the spirit of what is true for me. Not all the time, but when I can. Okay, I like this one first, okay. I am not the victim of my own life. I love this because the fire happened. It didn't happen to me. There is no pity pot for me. When I feel sorry for myself, which is often, but when I do, I cannot feel my children. I can't feel the hope and the love all around me. I believe that our job is to react to everything in life with as much grace and hope and love that we can muster. It, I have found this to be true in terms of what makes me feel better. So if you lose a job, or you get a job, or you lose a husband, or your three babies, or whatever it can be, whatever happens to you in your life, just know that you are not a victim of your own life. 
You have the power to change, which is the second thing. You can create change, and only you. So what do I mean by this? Basically, it's an inside job. In that space that is about an eighth of an inch behind your eyes, you can change. I can change. Not every day, but I can change just the perception, just the tiniest bit, and then the whole world opens up to me. And this can take an instant, not a year. It's something that can happen that quickly. Sometimes it doesn't last very long, but just knowing that it's there gives me, personally, a lot of hope. And the last one is, well, this is tough for me, hold on, okay. The last one is, there's nothing to be afraid of. I'm a walking, talking example of catastrophe, right? I'm everybody's worst nightmare in some ways. Um, and I can tell you that when I was on the other side of everybody dying, I felt afraid of that. And now that it's happened, there's nothing to be afraid of because I believe there's an eternity. There's a miracle in everything that happens. It's not great and it sometimes is really awful. And what's happened to me is like beyond, I, I had my own personal tsunami or my own personal war. And, um, but my children are here, they're here with me. And so for you and what I'm trying to say is don't be afraid. If you have a dream, go for it. If you wanna try something, go for it. If you like a guy, text him. <laughs> it's worth it. So today my life is rich, and I never thought I would say that. Today my life is about my girls and my legacy, Bill and our farm and our chickens, and advertising and its power to do good and especially do no harm. Because mathematically, mystically, or however you want to look at it, we should not exist, but we do. And only we have the power to make that mean something, whatever that means to us. Please go to our website at womennotobjects.com Sign the petition that asks CAN to please stop accepting ads that objectify women. Treat us less than equal. Um, I'm asking everyone here to do that. Um, that would be a great, great miracle for me. Um, and thank you so much. Have a great conference and thank you for your time.